started, this is our food labeling panel. I'd like to take a second to thank our current panelists for coming uh, and start uh, by introducing them. So our moderator today is Professor Wiener from here at the Law School. Uh, Jonathan Wiener is the William R. and Thomas L. Perkins Professor of Law at Duke. He is a professor of environmental policy at the Nicholas School and is a professor of public policy at the Sanford School. He is the director of the JDLM program in international and comparative law, and he received his JD from Harvard. He serves as the founding director of the Duke Center for Environmental, Environmental Solutions, which is now expanded into the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. He has worked on US and international environmental policy for the White House Council of Economic Advisors, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and the US Department of Justice in both the first Bush and Clinton administrations. Professor Mary Jane Angelo comes to us from the University of Florida Levin College of Law. She is a director of the Environmental and Land Use Law Program and a professor of law. She's also affiliate faculty in both the University of Florida School of Natural Resources and Water Institute. She received both her master's degree in entomology and her JD with honors from the University of Florida. After graduation, Professor Angelo practiced as an environmental lawyer. She served in the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Office of the Administrator, and Office of General Counsel in Washington, D.C., and she also served as Senior Assistant General Counsel for the St. John's River Water Management District in Florida. Professor Angelo has published extensively on a variety of environmental law topics, including pesticide law, endangered species law, water and wetlands law, sustainable agriculture, the regulation of genetically modified organisms, and the relationship between law and science. Professor Jason Sarneski comes to us from Pace Law School. He holds the Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law Chair and is Executive Director of the Environmental Law Program at Pace Law School. Professor Sarneski received his degree from the University of Chicago, and prior to joining the Pace Law faculty, Professor Sarneski was a faculty director of the U.S.-China Partnership for Environmental Law, a professor of law in the Environmental Law Center at Vermont Law School, and a faculty fellow at the Vermont Law Center for Agriculture and Food Systems. A Fulbright Scholar, Professor Sarneski served as a law clerk to the Honorable D. D. Brock Hornby of the U.S. District Court for the District of Maine, and as a law clerk for the Bureau of Legal Services at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. He has presented his work on environmentalism, natural resources law, food policy, and global economic, poli global economic and climate policy at universities, public interest organizations, government institutions, and conferences throughout the United States, Europe, and Asia. Dr. Mary Muth comes to us from just down the road at RTI International. She is the Director of Research Triangle Institute's Food and Nutrition Policy Research Program. Dr. Muth received her Master's in Agricultural Economics from Cornell University and her PhD in Economics from NC State University. She conducts research studies to analyze the impacts of food safety, nutrition, obesity, food assistance, food labeling, food marketing, and other types of policies and regulations, applying methodologies in the areas of industrial organization, microeconomics, econometrics, and statistical analysis, develops electronic models and databases, and conducts producer and consumer surveys to evaluate policy and provide information for the policy development. Thank you so much for serving on this panel, and I will turn it over to Professor Wiener. You eat. What do you want to know? Uh, do you know what's in the food? Does it have a label? Do you read the label? What does the label say? The label is necessarily selective. We can't say everything possible about what's in the food because that label would take more space than the food package itself. Uh, so how do we choose what's on the label? And what is the relationship between the uh, label and the audience? Um, and if we have different objectives, different kinds of information about different uh, consequences or attributes of the food and the supply chain, how the food was grown, what the impacts on the environment might be, what the f impacts of the food on the consumer might be, on the health, say, of the consumer, or ethical concerns, how do we uh, reconcile or trade off, are there trade-offs among those different objectives in trying to select which information is on the label? Those are the kinds of questions we're going to uh, discuss here. So our first speaker will be Ma Mary Jane Angelo, and um, uh, we'll take all three speakers and then have a period for questions afterwards. So Mary Jane, thank Thanks. you. I have to stand and show pictures. Um, 
So thank you so much for having me here, and thank you all for attending. It's really uh, great to see all this interest in food law, although I have to say I'm not really a food law expert. Um, I'm an environmental law expert, but the relationship between agriculture and environment is so intertwined, um, the way agriculture affects the environment and the way the environment affects agriculture that, you know, you, you kind of have to be a little bit of both. And um, the other thing, I was thinking about the label, because we're talking about labeling of food law, and I guess I think of it a little differently, um, although certainly food law is broader in some respects than agricultural law, we have to keep in mind that a lot of what we grow is not food. Um, we grow a lot of plants for fiber, uh, cotton, but also now uh, uh, largely driven by uh, policy decisions that have been made. We grow a lot of crops for biofuels. And um, so a lot of land that previously was either used for food production or conservation land is now being used for biofuel production. Let's see if I can use this. But I'm here to talk about labeling. And um, I, what I want to talk about mostly is this idea I have for whole system agricultural certification, which I'll get to in a minute. But since I'm the first speaker, I just thought I'd lay a little bit of a foundation for um, the labeling discussion. So you've all seen many, many kinds of labels on your foods. Some of them have been around for so long that we probably don't even notice them anymore. Some of them are new. Some of them we don't know what they mean. Some of them we know what they mean. Um, the other two speakers will be talking in more detail about some specific labels. Um, but let me just talk a little bit about the types we have. So we have certain labels that spring from some form of government regulation. Um, some of them are required, like nutritional labels. Some of them are not required, but if you're going to use certain terms or symbols on your product, you have to meet certain standards, like the um, organic labeling, the country of origin labeling is actually a required one, um, USDA grading standards. And then we have, there's countless third-party certifications. I just put a couple of them up there where there's some non-governmental third party that certifies that the products that bear certain labels meet standards. And then we have the self-declaration where people just put whatever they want to on their food um, or products. So what are the objectives of labels? I think that part of it is just this basic right to know. Should we have a right to know what we're putting in our bodies and the way it's being produced? Um, and this information then can be used to assist consumers in making choices um, based on what they value for their health or environment or ethical concerns. And um, the other objective of labeling can be to encourage certain practices, environmentally friendly or socially responsible practices through the market by making it known what practices are used and creating a marketplace where people will pay a premium for products that meet those standards. Um, so a lot of what I will focus on is sort of the third one, about how to encourage certain types of practices in our agriculture um, through incentivizing um, them through labels. Now, and I think Jason's going to talk a lot more about this, but I'll just mention it. There's a lot of things that labels can't do and that they don't do very well. And one is, what do these labels mean? You know, if, if a word natural is used, what does that mean? Does it really mean something? Does it mean the same thing to everyone? Um, how do we establish or who should establish standards to define what certain terms mean? You know, the term organic, I think a lot of people think of organic as something other than what it really is by law because it's uh, the standards that have to be met are pretty narrowly focused, um, whereas there's sort of what I call organic as religion, which is the sort of broader holistic approach um, that is not part of what's required by law. 
Then there's the accountability. How do we know if people are really um, complying with the criteria that um, are established to use certain labeling terms? Um, this is where, do, uh, should it be, you know, government inspectors, third party, certifying agencies, um, self accountability. And then, and I think this is what Jason's really going to spend a lot of time on, is what I call the TMI. Like too much information, there's too many labels, nobody knows what they mean. Um, you, you get a product and it has, you know, all this stuff on it. How do you know what it means, if it's true, whether you're willing to pay a premium for that product? Um, so some of the labels we know that are government mandated, and Dr. Booth will be talking about this, the nutrition labeling. Uh, we've known that for a long time. Other labels, I think, do people notice these USDA grading standard labels on their food? You know, does anybody make a decision on whether to buy something, whether it says USDA grade A or choice? Probably not, but what this, but these actually play an important role, not so much in consumer choice, but in retailer choice. So retailers demand certain grades of food so that they have nice looking, you know, consistently beautiful apples of a certain size. And it's not so much that consumers are saying, well, I mean me indirectly, that consumers are saying we have to have grade A food. It's that consumers have come to accept food that looks a certain way. And therefore, uh, these grading standards, it's not that there's anything unhealthy about food that doesn't meet grade A, but retailers often demand it so that their food looks uh, a certain way and is attractive to consumers. And therefore, this label, I mean, I never notice this on food I buy, but this label drives a lot of farming practices. It drives pesticide use, for example, to get fruit that looks a certain way. Um, one of the uh, more recent government required labels are the cool labeling, the country of origin for certain products um, where it's required now to show what country they come from. Um, then we have lots of the third party certified. Uh, fair trade has been around for a long time. Uh, that we have a lot now coming around with carbon footprint or other, um, or, or you know, other eco or environmental or health concerns that are noted on the label. Then we have things that are really probably not as clear what they mean, like words like natural or um, you know, some of these other terms that people just put on products. Oops, what did I just do? And then, you know, we always have sort of the label of the du jour, you know, and so now everyone's concerned with gluten, so we have all these different gluten-free labels and, you know, what do they mean? The, as I mentioned before, probably the one that we're most familiar with is the USDA organic label. And this is a government certification and labeling program so that farms have to meet certain standards to qualify to get the certification. And certain standards have to be met to get, to be able to use certain words and symbols on the product. Um, the reason I think the organic label is of such limited value, it's limited value, it has value, but it's limited, is because it mostly just tells you what you can't use. You can't use synthetic substances unless some that are on a specific list, so you can't use synthetic pesticides, you can use non-synthetic pesticides. Uh, you can't use radiation, GMO, sewage sludge, most animal hormones, and antibiotics. Um, but it isn't telling you what good farming practices are or how to deal with other aspects of environmental health or social concerns with farming practices. And I like to give the example of, um, I visited organic farms where the people are doing all this great stuff with the pesticide, you know, not using pesticides, et cetera, but they have like animal waste going straight into a water body, or they're using something that's very 
fossil fuel intensive, or they're still growing monocultures even though they're not using synthetic pesticides. So it's really just giving us sort of one piece, and it's not taking that you know, systems approach uh, that Sarah was talking about, for example. Um, you're probably familiar with the organic labels. You know, if it's, if you want to say 100% organic, um, it has to be 100% organic, and you can use the seal. If it's 95% or more, you can still use the seal, but you can't say 100%, you can say organic. If it's at least 70%, you can say made with organic ingredients, but you can't use the seal. If it's less than 70%, you can only say in the ingredient list, you know, on the nutritional label, like organic wheat or whatever. And so I don't know if the average consumer understands these distinctions, but um, these are what those label requirements are so that we can see that the way certain products are labeled. And then we have state organic labeling requirements as well. Uh, states or third-party certified certifying organizations for organic. And then we have the people who just write organic uh, with a magic marker on a sign. And we, that may or may not meet USDA standards, we don't know. Um, we also have a lot of small, true organic farmers who choose not to be certified, um, either because they just see it as an unnecessary cost and they know their consumers through farmers markets or CSAs, so why go through that? Or almost as sort of a political protest that organic doesn't mean legally what they think it should mean in practice. So um, we have other labeling programs that uh, I think Jason will talk about that might talk about carbon footprint, fair trade, other issues. But none of them really look at sort of the whole system. So what I have been proposing is this whole system approach that looks not just at is it using pesticides or not, does it have good waste management or, you know, um, what's its carbon footprint, but that looks at a lot of factors to, um, that all fit into this idea of the system as a whole, the farming system as a whole, and trying to use this to encourage the creation of resilient agricultural systems. So, um, let me move on a little bit. So what do I mean by resilience? And here I'm talking about something specific known as ecological resilience. And ecological resilience captures the strengths of redundancies in the system so that a system can survive uh, and adapt to perturbations or um, shocks to the system. And let me give you a classic example of comparing a non-resilient and resilient system. The Irish potato famine, which you've probably all heard of. In Ireland, there was one variety of potatoes that was being farmed back then in the early 20th century. In South America, they were farming over 200 varieties. When the potato famine came through this disease, it basically destroyed the entire uh, potato crop in Ireland because they were relying on this one variety. Whereas in South America, they had so many varieties, some of them got wiped out, but the other ones survived and they did not have a famine. So by having that redundancy, they had more resilience. So what are the hallmarks of a resilient agricultural system? And one of the biggest ones is diversity. And your dean spoke about this at this morning, the importance of diversity on many levels, um, using different crop species and varieties, such as with the potatoes, um, different planting patterns, crop rotation, intercropping, uh, providing cover crops and refugia or areas that are protected within the farm, integrating different plant and animal species into the farm system. Right now we have our industrial agriculture is about as non-resilient as you can get. We've created vast monocultures that 
where we basically sterilize the farm, five minutes, okay, except for the crop we're growing. And so when you grow thousands of acres of corn, you basically are creating this all-you-can-eat buffet for corn pests. And it's just sending out chemical signals from the plants, come here, plenty of corn, and no predators or parasites to get in your way of eating till your heart's content. So, and then the, the, para, or the pests live in the soil, and they're just building up population year after year. And by spraying, we're also killing off the predators and parasites that would provide natural control for those organisms. Um, this graph just shows the reality of what happens when we treat with pesticides. We'll get, we'll have pot, pest populations growing, growing, growing. We'll treat with pesticides. It'll knock them way down, and then they'll come back stronger than ever. And that's because the pesticides are killing the natural predators and parasites of the pests. And I'll skip that because I don't have much time. And they're also creating resistance among the pests to the pesticide. So this shows how in any population, there's some organisms that are more susceptible to the pesticide than, any, than others. And when they are killed off, the resistant ones then go on to produce in the next generation. And so then the next generation population is much more resistant, just like with antibiotic resistance. So we're creating more and more pest problems for ourselves. Actually, since we've started using pesticides in agriculture, our crop losses have gone up, our insect crop losses. Um, now, I'm not saying for every farm field that's true, but overall that is true. So a lot of these techniques like intercropping, crop rotation, integrated pest management, biological control, you know, here this is a caterpillar with uh, parasitic wasp eggs on it. There's a lot of things that we can do that create a more ecologically based system that's much more resilient to a lot of different changes that might occur as a result of climate change. We're going to see different pests different diseases coming through agricultural systems. We're going to have some places where there's too much water, some places where there's not enough. And so the idea is to build this resilient system. Um, there's a lot of benefits. Some of them, uh, you know, being able to withstand and adapt to change. Also, really improving our food security. As we are facing climate change, we're also in a world with a growing population and more and more affluence, people demanding better and more food. So this idea of whole system agricultural certification is looking at the whole system again. And what I am looking at is modeling it on the LEADS, um, Leadership in Envi Energy and Environmental Design, program, where it's green building certification that looks at the whole system. So under LEADS, some of you may be familiar with this, there are different categories that you get points for. And depending on how many points you collect for your green building, you can get LEED certified or LEED certified silver or gold um, or platinum. And these are the categories for LEADS. So I've tried to come up with categories for whole system agriculture, focused on building that resilience into that ecologically based system. And so not just looking at one or the other environmental or health issue, but looking at the system as a whole and how the parts fit together for um, building resilience. So for example, looking at the location, is this crop variety in a uh, appropriate location in terms of water availability, pest uh, populations, uh, uh, sensitive environments, or endangered species. Looking at the way it preserves biodiversity. Looking at the soil and water conservation practices. Um, the types of materials and resources it uses, such as renewable energy or reduced fossil fuel uses. Um, it can also look at social and labor issues, and then also have these sort of 
bonus points for innovation, to encourage innovation in the design of these systems. So the idea here is because LEEDS has been fairly successful with pushing green building in a certain direction, the idea is to think of ways that we can capture that whole system resilience, make it something that there's a market uh, incentive for to try to move agriculture in that direction. And I'll just say, I don't think this is a panacea. I think there are a lot of pieces necessary, as Sarah was saying, to solve these wicked problems. But I think that um, this could be one piece of it. So thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane. Our second speaker is uh, Jason Zarneski. Um, so thank you for having me uh, speak today. Um, I'm excited for two reasons to be here. One is to follow my, my good friend Mary Jane in, in speaking. And I think that her um, perspective as it relates to food labeling, um, while we're interested in, in, simple, in similar things, it's, it's different in that she has a very um, agricultural producer-based perspective, whereas my own work is more food consumer perspective to the extent, you know, the academy likes to draw a distinction between agriculture law and food law, um, though perhaps it should just be food systems law and we should end that distinction. Um, the second reason is I think this is a, an exciting time for this topic. Um, your dean talked about there's increased interest in, in food law policy. And when I started teaching in law schools over a decade ago, if I were to ask my students to raise their hand about how many of them were interested in food and agricultural policy, there would be no hands raised in the room. Um, and that's changed dramatically over the last decade as a result of popular press books like The Omnivore's Dilemma and also our increased interest in our own food. And so um, one of the reasons we're all here is we're all eaters. Um, and because we're all eaters, um, I think we would all enjoy eating an ethically farmed, locally sourced, GMO-free, USDA-certified, organic, sustainably harvest, all-natural New York green apple. Um, and, and so what I, I want to talk about today is uh, what Mary Jane called sort of the TMI. How do we bring order am amongst this, this chaos of labeling uh, in a sustainable food system. For those of you who shop at major grocery stores or in particular Whole, Whole Foods, it's almost overwhelming uh, the number of not only labels but claims that are made by products. And, and I, I don't only, I, we don't only see this in the food context, by the way. I was driving the, the other day and, and it said um, sustainable green dry cleaning on the side of a, on a dry cleaning van. I have, I have no idea what that means. Um, and so I, I think um, there are two major questions uh, that arise in, in terms of, of the issue of, of food labeling, and I'll primarily focus on the second. But the first is um, what challenges can actually be improved as a result of labeling? Um, I think the greatest challenge in law school uh, in talking to our students, um, regardless of field, is to see when students and, and, and in, in the real world we have problems, how do we uh, match the appropriate regulatory tool uh, to fixing the problem we want to fix. One way to do it is through informational regulation, which is my area of research, but there are others. Right? We can ban pesticides that are dangerous. Uh, we can tax uh, certain, certain items. Um, and information doesn't all, always have to exist through labeling as well. Um, now there's increased discussion about incorporating environmental concerns into our dietary guidelines. Uh, for example, if we're going to eat uh, meat, perhaps we should eat chicken rather than beef because of the lower carbon footprint. Uh, this is something that's also been uh, tried in, in Europe and, Scandin and, and especially in parts of Scandinavia. So I think that's, that's the first question. Um, the, the second question, which I'll primarily focus on, is how do we improve labeling itself? Um, and I would like to sort of to attack this in sort of uh, three uh, different steps, and I know that we should be brief because we, we are the panel that separates you from your lunch. 
um, which is important at a food law symposium. Um, so the first is to talk briefly about the challenges that we face uh, in eco-labeling for food. The second is to sort of build on the foundation built by Mary Jane to talk about the types of labeling and some examples of those challenges. And uh, three, to perhaps um, share some solutions that already exist and perhaps should be expanded and perhaps share some solutions that have not been pursued that we should achieve. So first, what are the challenges? Well, a, a, an initial challenge is greenwashing. Um, that there's a lack of transparency, clarity, and trust in the labels that we see. This leads to both consumer confusion, um, like my sustainable green dry cleaning, which isn't a food example, but I, I saw it two days ago, so it comes to mind. Um, but it could also lead to industry liability uh, as a result uh, by actions by the FTC and state consumer protection laws. Um, if, if a company makes claims about a product, are they able to back up those claims with real data? Uh, second, and I think this is a common challenge, it's just the proliferation of labels. Um, it creates consumer confusion. And even to the extent we are educated consumers, um, how do we compare amongst products? Uh, and I, that poses a huge challenge. Uh, there's at least over 600 certification labels for all products in the United States and at least 19 for food alone. Uh, these are certified. These are third-party third certifications. Not, we're, I haven't even gotten to first-party self-declared eco-labels yet. Um, a third challenge is uh, there's a desire for both increased information and the quality of that information. Um, and so as we want more information, we want that information to be better, better, but then even educated individuals like people in this room have a hard time deciding what to choose. Um, there's a great article in Time Magazine by John Cloud where he says, you know, I'm walking through the Manhattan grocery store, which he, for him was a, a Whole Foods in Union Square, and he said, well, how do I pick between the organic apple from California or the conventional apple uh, that is local from in New York State. I mean, those are really challenging questions, um, and it's not clear to me that labeling at the at this point can answer those questions. Uh, two more. So the, the the third challenge is the creation of markets and product availability. Um, once we have a label that we're comfortable with and we understand, how do we uh, let that label uh, proliferate and and so it, more products use it? Um, and then there are some certifications labels that are really good, um, but there's no market for them. People don't know about them. Um, and I, it occurred to me during Mary Jane's talk that we have some farms that aren't certified at all. They have no label, but they're fantastic. Um, how do we know about those uh, if, we're, if, if they can expand their production? And then I think the last challenge is... Um, the cost of, of, of certification and, and the uh, administration costs and the administration burdens for farms. And so um, we see this sort of perverse incentive where uh, we have this idea of small pastoral farms that can be organic and all natural and things like that. Um, but due to the increased demand for certification that has cost and the increase, like from the previous panel, the increased concerns about food safety, it's really the larger firms that are the best position to comply with federal laws. It relates to both certification and food safety. Yet, those are the firms which, at least historically, uh, have, at least in recent years, have had the largest food safety problems occur as well. I mean, you can look at the listeria outbreak in cantaloupe. While that was a small farm, that was a result of a massive expansion by a singular farm trying to meet their demand, uh, uh, I think, for Walmart, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm correct. So those are some of the, the challenges, I think, that, that arise. Um, some examples. So... Um, I think that we can categorize uh, food eco-labels into at least three categories. One is your first-party self-declared eco-labels. The second is uh, third-party certification, which uh, is voluntary, which can be through private certification 
or through certification processes that are endorsed uh, by federal or state law. And then the third would be a uh, government mandatory food eco labeling. Now, the first first party self declared eco labeling is just an enormous problem. Um, there are claims like all natural, uh, responsibly sourced, sustainable. Uh, these pose real challenge to consumers in terms of what they mean. They c and they also pose increased challenges to producers uh, because they have no uh, data to back up their claims. Um, what am I talking about? Imagine you uh, sell a product, any product. We can talk about food because we're at a food symposium. And um, you think... Uh, your product is uh, ethically and sustainably produced. It's your business. So what do you do? Your firm creates its own department. We call it the green department. And so you're going to certify your own product green. OK, great. Um, but there's a lack of, of data and empirical evidence to back up that claim. I visited a factory in China um, that was producing, uh, it, does, it does machine parts uh, for various items. And uh, they, they worked with an unnamed American company. Well, I know the name, but I'm not going to share it with you. And, um, and uh, the company asked them to write on their packaging, uh, ethically and responsibly produced in China. So we asked, well, what did you, what did you do to have this ethically and responsibly, uh, responsibly produced in China? And... Um, they went into a, a, a defense of, of Mr. Hu, the owner, because Mr. Hu, Hu in their minds, was one of the most ethical uh, factory owners in, the, in this province. He let his employees off at 4 o'clock so they could pick up their children from school. He fed them lunch. He fed the, it gave them a reasonable wage. And so in the minds, this was, this was completely legitimate. Um, but, I, but then we sort of had to step back, and we said, no, we, we, Mr. Who is fantastic, actually a very nice guy. And, um, but what did the American company, what additional things did they ask you to do, put this on the label? And they said, well, they didn't ask us to do anything. They asked us to put it on the label. And so that's what they did. So that's the concern with this sort of first party labeling. Now, the, the, the second example is your third party um, certification. As I said, there, there can be two examples of this, government and private. I think the best government example is our USDA uh, organic. And there the question is, what does organic mean? Um, what does certified organic mean from a legal perspective? And then what does the public think it means when they buy it? Um, as Mary Jane mentioned, if you see some a product that says organic on it, it does not mean it's 100% organic. And in fact, you, it has to say, or it would say 100% organic if that was actually the case. But um, a product that says organic somewhere on the box may contain as low as 70% organic material. Um, and so, you know, when we buy our kids, you know, Annie's organic macaroni and cheese, um, in fact, that product is not entirely organic. Um, so there's the meaning of the term. Um, it also brings to mind the national exemption list, where there are uh, non-organic things that can be included uh, in organic products. Um, and for some things, they're, they're organic um, components just don't exist. Um, and so that's, that's not possible to do. Um, but then there's our own version of organic. Uh, you know, this idea of, of a small farm with happy cows, uh, and happy farmers and happy workers, all uh, producing uh, perfect produce uh, that is delivered, you know, directly to our home um, and or our grocery store. And so there might be a, a mismatch there. The other is we can have voluntary private third-party certifications. Um, a good example is seafood, where we see the very popular uh, Marine Stewardship uh, Council logo. Um, but there are others like the Gulf of Maine Research. Institute has its own sustainably harvested uh, logo. And those mean very different things. Uh, MSC has one set of standards, and the GMRI standard is, just means that you're conforming with federal law in terms of fishing uh, in the Gulf of Maine. So it's both a local and a compliance uh, seal. 
Um, so that might be a concern about having this proliferation of labels in that. And then also many people keep the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch card in their wallet as well. Um, and if you sort of line those up, um, there's not a, a match. Um, and so that might lead to some consumer confusion. A third example is uh, mandatory government labeling. Um, we see this in our country of origin labeling, our cool labeling. Um, unclear how that relates to sort of environmental protection. Maybe it's a bad proxy for food miles, and so that might be valuable to us. Uh, we see this in other contexts. We've talked a lot about the Vermont GMO labeling bill, which requires labeling if, if a product is genetically modified. It also puts restrictions on the word natural, uh, which is, is a fairly unique component of the law. Um, so finally, because I have five minutes left, um, what about some, some solutions? What solutions might I come up with? So um, the first is I'm a supporter of government-sponsored uh, labeling. Uh, the data seems to suggest that government-sponsored labels become well-known, uh, accepted by the public, uh, whereas Mary Jane um, has concerns about the organic logo uh, because of what's actually happening on the farm. Um, and it's always exciting to disagree on these panels. Um, my view is that actually organic labels are a huge success. Uh, we all know, all know what it is. Uh, we know, we're familiar with the logo, and so there, from a consumer perspective, it's a success. So I guess as a second solution, um, how can we build on that organic logo? Could we create an organic plus, uh, which uh, sort of folds in things like carbon labeling and life cycle analysis into the meaning of the organic logo. This is what's happening in Sweden through an organization called CROB, which is a third party uh, certifier there. Also, um, it is completely lawful uh, under the Organic Act for a state to require uh, increased standards for its organic logo. No state has ever tried it. Um, but that would be very interesting where if you took a state like Oregon, Vermont, New York, California, and they created a, uh, a more rigorous organic logo, would that uh, develop some consumer cachet? Uh, I guess the last solution that I'll, I'll leave you with um, is also to improve uh, consumer protection and encourage, we need to encourage producers to substantiate uh, their claims. Uh, the UN FAO has eco-labeling guidelines uh, which organizations should follow, but the FTC has just produced their green guides, um, which while non-binding, uh, suggest how the FTC uh, might uh, go after firms under Section 5 of the FTC Act um, to help deal with, with problems of, of, of consumer fraud and suggesting to firms that they can no longer make uh, self-declared uh, statements on their products without having uh, some data to back that, up, back that up, which leads us to perhaps a model for improved third-party certification, which allows for clarity, accuracy, transparency, uh, measurability, and ultimately impact um, when we choose to purchase products that have uh, food eco-labels. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Our third speaker is Dr. Mary Muth. Okay. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here today. We have an active research program on um, food and agricultural policy at RTI International, so it's always really nice to come out and visit with some of our local uh, universities that are also interested in some of, some of these very similar topics. And so I'll be talking from the perspective in a, of an economist. Um, hopefully you won't hold that against me since I'm the only economist speaking this morning. Um, and so what I'll be talking about, um, sort of touching on some of the things that have been mentioned already today, is what's generally regulated and not regulated on food lab labels, primarily at the federal level, the costs of relabeling and reformulating foods in response to regulation, and then finally um, talking about some of the likely impacts of upcoming changes to um, on required labeling on all, all food products sold in the U.S., so essentially Approximately 700,000 products will have to be relabeled over the next three years, so which will have some pretty significant implications for the food supply. 
Um, so who regulates labeling of food, food products? Um, Mary Jane and Jason talked about this a little bit um, and some of the earlier speakers. So USDA's Food Safety and Inspection System regulates the labeling of meat, poultry, and liquid egg products. Um, not shell eggs, that's under FDA. FDA regulates labeling on all other products, but there are some exceptions for organic labeling and country of origin labeling. That's regulated by USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. So labeling regulation at the federal level is, is actually split up over multiple agencies. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what's actually regulated on the label and on, at the federal, federal level and what's not. So, so at the core, the, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act says that labels have to be truthful and not misleading. However, this, of course, doesn't mean that um, the agencies regulate everything on the label. So they do regulate, of course, basic information like the brand name and the product name quantity statement. They also regulate the content and format of the nutrition facts panel and the ingredient list. And a um, little interesting factoid about the nutrition facts panel is that all of those nutrients listed are plus or minus 20%. So there's a pretty wide margin of error that food manufacturers have when they label their foods. Um, uh, and they also regulate, agencies regulate product claims. There's essentially three different categories. There's nutrient content claims that, for example, food could be low, might say that it's low fat or it has 100% of the daily value for vitamin C. They regulate health claims. There's, uh, I think, 18 claims that have been pre-approved by the FDA. For example, um, the relationship between calcium intake and preventing osteoporosis. Um, and then there's a category called qualified health claims, and this is where companies would have to submit proof that there is a relationship between consumption of a specific type of food or nutrient and a health, health benefit. And as far as I can tell on the FDA website, I don't think they've ever approved a petition to include one of these qualified health claims, and maybe some of you know, know that more than There's just a lot of denial letters um, so primarily, the product claims are in the nutrient content and health claim category. Um, there's also regulations requiring that foods labeled that there's a potential allergen, such as nuts and shellfish, since that's a major public health issue. Um, for meat and poultry, there is the requirement for the USDA inspection seal, which actually has the plant number where the food is produced. And this is another interesting thing is, is you can look up that number that's on your meat or pro poultry product and, and actually find the name and location of the plant that produced that product. Um, so what's not regulated by the federal government? So product dating is not regulated. It's regulated by some states. So those use by or sell by dates that you see on products is not regulated by the federal government, So which has some pretty... Um, interesting implications for sustainability because those dates are based on quality. They're not based on food safety. Um, and, and so in a lot of cases, there is food that may be discarded that's perfectly suitable for com consumption, but a consumer throws it out because it's past that date, which is, again, for quality and not for food safety. Um, there's no regulation of front-of-package nutrition labeling, again, as long as it's truthful and not misleading. Um, the FDA has allowed voluntary systems such as the nutrition, such, such as Facts Up Front, which you may have seen on a lot of products. So that was an industry-developed system by the Grocery Manufacturers Association and the Food Marketing Institute. Um, genetically modified ingredients are not required to be labeled unless the food is significantly different from its traditional counterpart, except some states have, have begun to pass regulation in that area. Um, federal government also does not regulate any types of eco-labeling, as long, again, as long as it's truthful and not misleading. So, and, and also in terms of if a product is out of compliance with specific labeling um, regulations, it's tip, the agencies refer to that product as being misbranded. So that's their, their term that they apply to that. So, so next I want to talk about a couple of tools that we, we developed and use at, at um, RTI. Um, for, for the agencies to look at the costs of different um, of labeling changes and, and um, reformulation that may occur in response to labeling changes. So um, these are tools that we've developed primarily for FDA, but they've also been used by USDA. 
to estimate industry costs of its regulations as part of the cost-benefit analyses that are required under Executive Order 12866, which was reaffirmed by President Obama under Executive Order 13563. So both of these models have been developed based on store scanner data that comes from the Nielsen Company that defines all foods that are sold in the United States. Um, and from the data that's in the labeling cost model, when a company has to update the label on a single UPC product, it could be anywhere from four to eight thousand dollars for a minor change, and as much as ten to seventeen thousand for a major change. And if it if that change also requires any change in the actual dimensions of the packaging or the labeling, then the costs are even higher. And so the. Reformulation costs also factor into labeling regulations because a lot of labeling regulations drive reformulation. And, and I want to talk a little bit about how the nutrition facts panel is going to drive major, major reformulation um, in, just, in just a minute. So, so although reformulation of a product in response to a labeling requirement is a voluntary response to the regulation, FDA does include the cost of reformulation when it does its cost-benefit analysis. So, um, and then in looking at sort of past regulation has driven a lot of reformulation. When FDA added a requirement to list trans fatty acids on the Nutrition Facts Panel in 2006, food manufacturers basically reformulated most trans fatty acids out of the food supply. Um, it's not all gone, and here, this is another interesting sort of um, implication of that regulation. As long as the product contains less than 0.5 grams of trans fatty acids in a serving, it shows up as 0%. So if you want to know whether or not a food actually still contains trans fatty acids, even though it says 0%, you have to look at the ingredient list, and you'll see there that if it lists partially hydrogenated vegetable oil as an ingredient, it still has trans fatty acids in it. So, so the regulation did drive a lot of reformulation. Basically, food manufacturers changed the types of oils that they were used in foods, but it is still there, and that's because, the lab because of how that labeling is set up on the product. Um, the reformulation cost model that we developed for FDA um, actually provides estimates anywhere from about for a small company that's doing a relatively minor reformulation, it would probably cost them about $20,000 to reformulate the foods. In contrast, those estimates go all the way up to about $4 million for a large food manufacturer who's doing a more significant type of reformulation. So it's a pretty costly undertaking when a company does reformulate its foods in response to um, labeling or, or any other changes that might be going on in the marketplace. So, um, and the regulatory impact analysis for some of the upcoming regulation changes, FDA is using our, our models to estimate the cost. So I want to talk a little bit about those. Um, there's, there's actually two different types, two different regulations that have been proposed. These are right now slated to go into effect on January 1st of 2018, unless the, unless the agency delays those. One is the change in the nutrition facts panel. The other is a regulation that sort of goes side by side with that, which changes the serving sizes for a lot of foods that are being sold in the United States. So the serving size that's actually listed on the nutrition facts panel is going to increase for a pretty substantial number of foods. Um, so, um, so FDA has proposed those proposed those changes in March 2014. So, so as I mentioned at the beginning, that doesn't affect meat, poultry, and egg products, um, but the Food Safety and Inspection Service will be coming out with a regulation to also um, basically do the, the exact same updates to all the foods that it, it regulates. Um, so it will cover all products that are sold in the U.S. So the changes to the Nutrition Facts Panel um, some of it is just refreshing the, the design. They're making the number of calories much more prominent because that's one, the, one of the areas that um, the U.S. public probably needs to be paying a little more attention. Um, it's now going to require listing of added sugars on the label. So not just total sugars, but now separating out the added sugars from the natural sugars. They're removing the line for calories from fat since that was, didn't, didn't appear to be useful to consumers. They're removing the requirement to list vitamin A and vitamin C 
um, the percentage of the daily value from those two, and instead they're going to add a requirement to list vitamin D and potassium, which are nutrients that are becoming of increasing concern um, to public health. Um, and they're also updating the daily values for some nutrients, that, and that's the value that the percentage is based on. Um, and as I mentioned, they're, they're updating the serving sizes for numerous fruit, foods to make them more realistic, and also for foods that are typically consumed in one sitting, um, they're, they're um, requiring that the nutrition information reflects the entire package. So if you, if you buy a 20-ounce soda that's Two and, a half, two and a half servings, now it would be treated as one serving, and the nutrition information would reflect that. So what are the implications of all of these proposed, proposed changes? So I think one of the most major ones will be that many products are going to be reformulated to reduce added sugars. So this is probably going to have a pretty significant impact on the type of sweeteners that are used in a lot of processed products. It could mean a lot more artificial um, sweeteners being used in products, a combination of, uh, possibly a combination of natural and artificial. Um, that may be sort of more, maybe an unintended consequence of, of the regulation. Um, um, and sort of, in addition to that reformulation, though, that requirement to list added sugars is going to impose a significant burden on a lot of smaller companies that actually might not have the technical knowledge to determine to break out natural sugars from their um, from natural sugars on their label. So it, that that's a hurdle that a lot of smaller manufacturers will have to overcome uh, over time. Um, there will also probably be a lot of reformulation to, re to fortify foods with vitamin D and potassium since it now shows up on the label. So food manufacturers may think that consumers would respond more positively to foods that have high percentages for those. Um, and we've seen that in some, some of the past regulations where food manufacturers will fortify to get those, those percentages up, which, which could be of a benefit to some people and, but not, not to all may raise the cost of the product. Um, um, another potential implication is that a lot of foods that now have the statement healthy, which is a regulated claim, they have to meet certain um, percentages of daily value for fat, saturate, saturated fat, sodium, and other nutrients. So uh, a lot of products with the changes in the serving sizes may not be able to use that healthy claim anymore, which the, may drive them to reformulate the product so that they can continue to use that claim. Um, and then also, as, as I mentioned about trans fatty acids, with the change in the serving sizes, a lot of foods no longer will be able to say 0% trans fatty acids. It will become some positive number, which would then again drive reformulation so they can get it back down to 0%. So, so some of the implications of all that reformulation that may be going on is some um, drastic reductions in the t or dr drastic changes in the types of raw ingredients that are being used in food products, which ultimately then has some implication for sustainability of the food supply of the food system as different types of ingredients are being substituted and not necessarily in a positive way. Um, so, in summary, what can we expect due to the proposed? nutrition labeling changes. So as I mentioned, substantial reformulation of food, packaged foods sold in the U.S., particularly by larger companies that are concerned about maintaining market share of their products um, because of consumer response to the label. Um, we can expect substantial costs of the mandatory portion of the regulation in terms of what actually has to be changed on the label, um, but also substantial costs in terms of the voluntary response that a lot of un companies will undertake in response. To it. Um, I, from my perspective, I think there's going to be a lot of difficulties for smaller companies um, um, that are um, to comply with the regulation, particularly in adding added sugars to the label and just the, the sort of logistic concerns about actually implementing the change and determining all of their new nutrition um, information for their products based on the new new, ser new serving sizes. Um, so, and also, um, as we've talked with a lot of food manufacturers about 
the process they're going to have to go to to go through to update all of their labels. One of the things that they commented on is that during the next three years, while they're implementing this change, it's going to substantially divert their attention away from other labeling initiatives or other product development initiatives. So they may be putting things on hold that they would have been doing otherwise as they're implementing this change. And so that could, again, have may slow down some, some of the efforts that are going, going towards um, developing more sustainable food systems. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thanks to all our speakers. We have, uh, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes um, for um, questions and discussion. We have to, do we have to end at 12.25? Um, lunch starts at 12.30. Who's in charge of the lunch? <laughs> Francesca. Uh, 12.30. Yeah. Okay, I have a faculty meeting at 12.30, so. Um, 12.25 it is. There you go. Um, Unless you want to go to 1.30 and we'd understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> so lots of interesting questions, uh, issues that were raised here. Um, too much information, so many labels uh, from different sources possible confusion, and also, even if the labels are all true, so even if there's not greenwashing or fraud, the multiplicity of true labels serving different objectives can, um, can confuse consumers or can, be, can raise trade-offs that are difficult to compare. How do we compare a cross-product with multiple uh, different scores on different attributes, each of which is trying to be communicated in, um, in a different kind of... Uh, qualitative or quantitative information. And uh, so that's, I think, I think a general question that everyone raised. And, and to make that more complicated, we have different agencies survey, supervising different aspects or not supervising aspects of these, um, this information provision. Um, but I want to ask, just to start us off, a, a different question that goes um, in part to the consumer confusion or really it's the, it's the audience response question, um, which is, uh, what, what's the state of the art or what advances do we need in understanding the actual response of the people who see the label to the information on the label? So behavioral psychology, um, the um, understanding how different framing of uh, use choice of different terms or the presentation, for example, um, uh, changing the structure of the nutrition facts label or where it's presented or the, you know, the color, uh, the logo designs, um, cartoon imagery, uh, et cetera. How do, um, and you could think of all sorts of things that would be true to put on a label but would have um, potentially uh, um, uh, inflammatory or, um, you know, other... Uh, influences on the af the affect the behavioral response of consumers. I mean, Im imagine if uh, a can of chicken soup had to say on it contains animal parts, which is true, but would sound frightening. Um, <laughs> you could think of lots of those or irradiated food. I mean, I think this is a past a past question where irradiated food. Uh, at least some consumers thought that meant that the food was radioactive. Um, or it sounded frightening. So uh, there could be these these behavioral affect questions could arise in all sorts of labels. So I just um, just want to raise those kinds of questions. What do we know about the actual behavioral effect and how we choose these labels to have the desired influence rather than an unintended influence on uh, on the audience? Anybody care to I'm happy to go talk about that? So um, so I think we could know a lot more than we do. And I think within sort of the issue you raised, there are sort of two separate questions. One is, what do we need to do so the consumer actually sees, reads, consumes the information, and acts upon the information? There's some data on that. And then once the consumer acts on that information, does it actually have the intended consequence or impact that we might want. For example, it leads to a more sustainable food system. Um, 
there's hardly any data on the latter. So I don't have anything to share on the latter question. Um, uh, on the former question, we do know that either government, data suggests that either government sponsored labels or labels that have been in existence for a very long time and thus have a lot of consumer confidence uh, work. I think we see that with USD Organic in the US. I think we see that with Krav in Sweden, Germany's Blue Angel labeling program. Um, those are examples where they're very well known. We also know that consumers uh, are most most review labels when they're at the point of purchase, they're easy to see. Um, and so as sort of as close to the pr purchasing of the product or at the cash register as you could make them, the consumers will more act on them. I mean, there's a reason that they keep candy and gum uh, right at the, right, and all that, that expensive chocolate right as you're trying to, to check out of the grocery store. Um, so you, we sort of have to figure out how to do that. I think there's a third component where I'm not, I think it fits with the, the first question, but it's hard for me to figure out what to do with it, and that's an issue of design. Um, my understanding is that like, the nutritional facts uh, um, uh, that we see on food you know, won a lot of design awards, um, and we all read it, um, yet Americans do not eat particularly healthy. Um, and so... Uh, you know, we can we all read a, a lot of the ingredients, and we can't pronounce half of them. So even though that information is available, we're not acting on that in, in that information. Um, so I guess if, if sort of my remedy would be to have um, well-known third-party certifiers, increase government sponsorship, and I and incorporate. Uh, carbon and life cycle analysis into readily identifiable graphical labels and really shrink the amount of, of labels that we see on, on food products. Yeah, and picking up on that, and I'm not a behavioral economist, but I've read a little bit about what people respond to, like, um, you know, if you just have a speed limit sign, people don't follow it as much as if you also have the thing that says, you know, the speed limit is 25 miles an hour, you are traveling at 30 miles an hour, then people will slow down. But what people respond to even more, apparently, is like an emoticon with a, you know, a smiley face or a frowning face. <laughs> and so, and to like, I think Jason's right, we need to simplify, but convey information. And it may be that you know, there have been proposals for having, like, energy, water, pesticide, blah, and then having, like, you know, smiley face, frowning face, or having red, green, or yellow to sort of provide a lot of information in a simplistic way. I don't know if that would really work or not, but there people are having those discussions. And I do agree with you on the USDA organic. Uh, I think it's been very successful. That's not, that's not fun. <laughs> but I think it's been successful for what it is. It's just that what it is is something very narrow. Yeah, yeah. I guess I want to add to specific to the nutrition facts panels. FDA um, surveys has its health and diet surveys that it does every few years, and it asks consumers about whether or not they they look at the nutrition facts panel and whether or not they actually change the foods that they. Um, consume in, in response to that. And I don't know all the specific percentages off, off the top of my head, except one of the things that I, I do remember is that about half of consumers who respond to the survey say that they'll, they look at the nutrition facts panel the first time they're going to buy a, a product. And then, and then they essentially stop looking at it. But, but even, you know, first purchase, only half, half of consumers are even looking at it. So, so if they're not even looking at it, it's really not going to, going to influence their behavior. Um, so, so that may say something about sort of the average food consumer in the U.S. Um, but, I, but I do think that with a lot of these types of um, um, labeling changes or requirements, again, a lot of, we get a lot of bang for the buck actually from food manufacturers' responses to how they think an average consumer is going to respond. So if they think a, food, a consumer is going to respond in a certain way, they'll actually reformulate the product um, and, and so even though probably the vast majority of Americans aren't really that concerned about trans fatty acids, enough of them are concerned that it drove food manufacturers to, to reformulate it down to the levels where it is now. Um, and I think actually another important driver in this whole process that really hasn't come up yet this morning is that the, the groups that 
that represent consumers, particularly the um, Center for Science and the Public Interest and the Consumer Federation of America. Um, they're representing sort of the average consumer who may not be that involved in, in kind of the, the, whole, the whole food system, but it's the pressure that they put on both the regulatory agencies and on food manufacturers that drives a lot of change in the products that are in the marketplace. I would just very briefly add that the, the elephant in the room is that the most important food label that we haven't talked about at all is the price tag. Um, and, you know, price could have a huge impact on, you know, we could tax, you know, tax unhealthy foods, but we live in a country that, you know, people are nutrition poor but calorie rich. And so that, I just wanted to raise that. I could say more, but I think that should be, should be stated. Okay. Questions, comments? Yes, in the back. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, so um, I was wondering if uh, you think there might be any benefit to creating a government-regulated term for the word sustainable, um, because that is a word that um, has been used a lot in the environmental community. And what I'm actually seeing is that the environmental community is kind of starting to shy away from that term and go to the term resilient um, and creating resilient systems. Um, I appreciate the first presenter um, ex actually defining ecological resiliency. I think that was really, um, really great. But I just, that word is thrown around, sustainable and sustainability is thrown around a lot. And um, if you go to Monsanto's website or Bayer Crop Science, you'll see a lot of them use the word sustainable. And so uh, I think it's becoming a diluted term, but I think it's a term that has a lot of integrity. And it was put forth in the Brentland Commission um, of the UN in the late 80s. And it, it's the three-legged stool that we all know. And I, I think it is a term that we shouldn't shy away from. I think it does have some um, some some validity. So I, I was just curious what your thoughts were on that. Maybe not so much a label, but um, creating a government regulated definition for a term like that. My own thoughts. Anyone want to comment? So, um, so I think generally, at least among scholars, you're seeing a movement from the word sustainable to resilience. Um, I think that's right. We might be we might be moving from one word that means nothing and everything to another word that means nothing and everything. Um, I mean, as it relates to food, I think it's interesting that the FTC Green Guides, which did uh, seek to provide some guidance on words like renewable and compostable, um, chose not to provide any guidance on the words natural and sustainable because they didn't know what they meant. Um, I think um, the word sustainable uh, could gain real meaning by sort of Harkening back to our more natural resources law conservation principles, um, you know, there were basic terms like the word sustainable as it relates to forestry that made a lot of sense. Um, if a tree stand takes 100 years to grow and you build a, and create 100 stands of trees, you cut one down a year, and then 100 years that stand grows back. That was the basic definition of sustainable. The problem is um, that nothing any of you have in front of you, your computers or anything else, even meets that basic level of sustainability. I think to the extent you're going to create that sustainability can have meaning in the food systems context is I think you would have to develop best practices across the life cycle of different markets, almost do like an antitrust analysis for markets, develop best practices for those markets, and then you could say if you develop those best practices, that's sustainable, and therefore you could, you know, have this seal of approval. But I think what you need is some, uh, you have to determine it by market sector, um, creates a methodology to come up with those best practices and definitions of sustainable, define those criteria, and then ultimately come out with a way to convey that information to consumers. So this is something that makes me crazy. Um, we are very good at taking words that mean something and turning them into words that don't mean anything. Like you said, sustainability means so many different things to so many people that it basically means nothing. And I 
started to cringe about 10 years ago when the environmental law community started using the word resilience because resilience <laughs> means something very specific in science. And in fact, it means something very specific in engineering and something very different in ecological. And that's why I put a sort of abbreviated ecological definition. I use that term to mean I'm using ecological resilience is what I'm talking about. But people have diluted that to the point where everybody just throws it around and I don't think it means anything anymore. <clears throat> and so there'll be a new word that we'll do the same thing to. I'm not sure what it is yet. <laughs> Michelle? So I have an idea about that word, <laughs> just thinking about it. Um, there have been a number of uh, farm systems that have been certified as biodynamic in the European Union, and you're starting to see some of those terms incorporated now for different types of farming systems here in the United States. Is that a term that has any kind of verifiable meaning, or is that a concept that is similar to the whole farm certification proposal that, uh, that you've recommended? I think uh, biodynamic is probably part of the whole farm certification that I'm talking about, but uh, what I'm talking about is something broader than that, I think. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I know that term, I think, is also starting to be used in lots of ways that mm -hmm. don't, aren't necessarily the way it started out. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Shanna? Hi, um, thank you so much for your comments. I, I'm just curious, I think one of the things that we haven't covered in this panel is really sort of like where the enforcement and monitoring is going to come from in these systems. And so, you know, independent third party certification, you know, is often like referred to as the gold standard, but there's a lot of empirical evidence to suggest that that's not necessarily the case. And there are tremendous problems vis a vis um, firms being able to venue shop or select which monitor and enforcer or verifier they would like to have come to their farms. And so that it, it complexifies, right, the effectiveness possibilities for the regulation. Um, so apart from consumers correctly using it on one end, we need to also think about what, what's happening uh, via these enforcement mechanisms. So I'm wondering if, um, if any of you all can comment sort of on, um, as we are seeing the increasing proliferation, lack of government funding for uh, even US-sponsored auditing uh, or compliance, sort of w where do you envision uh, that piece coming into play? How are we going to fund this and ensure that um, effectiveness is happening uh, at the sort of bottom of the pyramid as well as at the consumer end? So um, <laughs> that's actually a really good question. Um, so uh, quicker. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I would say that as it relates to um, certification claims, I mean, that would fall under the FTC. And it will be interesting to whether the FTC actually brings actions under Section 5. There are also a lot of state mini FTC laws. California comes to mind that actually um, is bringing claims not necessarily on food products, but other uh, chemical products and durable goods that are making claims. So that's one way to do it. Um, in terms of, I, I mean, the FDA, uh, in my view, has completely abdicated um, all of their power and authority as it relates to, to labeling. Um, I think they have much more labeling authority and enforcement authority than they uh, than they state they have. Um, a good example that comes to mind is GMO salmon. Um, and so I think those are those would be the two bodies I would I would look to. Um, I also think it's interesting from a comparative I I perspective where the US government plays a, and state governments play a large role as it relates to labeling, where our European counterparts rely um, Entire, and almost entirely on, on well-known third-party certifiers, and there's not that same um, maybe lack of trust or prob problems there. Um, and so that might suggest that there's a model. I mean, one idea um, that I've proposed is that if states want to create their own certifications, um, why not hire well-known highly respected certifiers uh, in, sort of, in sort of public private partnerships. Yeah, it seems like the reputation of the third party certifier is, a, is an issue there. And if some fourth party <laughs> said the third party certifier is uh, doing a bad job, that would, that would um, 
So there may be competition among third party certifiers. Well, it, what's also really interesting about that is there's some funding issues. Like, how do you the, cert the good certifiers get funding so they're well known? Now there's been these creative funding mechanisms where well known existing certifiers are essentially uh, generating the seed money to create new certifiers in other in other sectors because they have the right business model. They're just dealing in a different market. <clears throat> Um, other other people had hands up. Other questions? We may have time for one more. Yeah, Francesca. Sure. Um, I, my understanding that the hot button issue right now is GMO labeling, and so I would just love to hear what your thoughts are. If you think this is necessary, or if you think it will actually just add to the noise and further confuse consumers. So I was um, working at EPA w and with USDA and <laughs> FDA on the first. GMO regulations in the late 80s or early 90s, and we had this debate back then, and what this is just one perspective, but what's so interesting to me is that the, the reason that FDA said they couldn't do GMO labeling is because it would be impossible to put labels on like every piece of fruit or something, and now you go in the grocery store and every piece of fruit has a label, you know, a little sticker on it. Um, yeah, that was a huge decision that was made that I I think was probably not a good decision. And so we let the whole GMO, you know, market just proliferate before anybody even knew it. And because we didn't know that that was in our products. And now it's like we're trying to catch up and it's like the horse is out of the barn. I don't know. Um, but it was just so interesting to me the reason that they said it couldn't be done. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, I guess I was going to, what I wanted to add to that was that um, there, there are so many genetically modified ingredients that we're already consuming every day. Um, and so I guess that, so from FDA's perspective, they're not seeing a public health threat from consumption of those. Um, and so, so I, I don't think that they feel compelled with everything else that's on their plate to ever go down the route of requiring the labeling. But if it does become required, Almost everything you, any processed food that you eat is going to say it has genetically modified ingredients. And so, um, except unless it was, it, unless it's an organic food. And, and I think some people have the perspective of, of the organic label can accommodate the fact that the product is not genetically modified. You don't need a separate labeling system. So that's that's one perspective. But I think if it ever did come to be that you, that Foods said that they're genetically modified. It would increase the cost of food because a lot of foods would it would have have a really dramatic impact on farming practices in the United States that would have to evolve over time, and it would would increase the cost of food. And so that's sort of the trade off in terms of what you know, sort of what's best for the society as a whole. I would just say that you know the big question is what's GMO. Um, I was on a panel with scientists, and it, it literally blew my mind in terms of, like, it can have so many different meanings. Um, you know, for example, is there a big difference between a papaya, which is susceptible to, to disease um, that's just missing a gene, so it doesn't receive that disease, versus aqua bounty salmon, which is a salmon which has genes from an ocean pout, which is like an eel-like fish, and those might raise environmental and um, allergenic concerns. Um, are those both GMO products that need to be labeled or not? <laughs> okay, we have to leave it there. Thank you uh, very much to all our speakers. And uh, now, Sean, we have lunch. Yeah, so lunch is on its way. If you can give us like five minutes to set it oh. all up before you run out of food, it'll be right up.